<laughs> uh, thank you, Kevin, for the intro. How's everyone doing? We're in the, the mid-afternoon, last uh, session before the, the keynote at the end. Um, but I think this will be really fun. Um, I'm going to show a lot of awesome video, uh, and I'm also going to share some research that Google has done that I think is really the first of its kind um, in unpacking some of the variables uh, in video content. Um, and uh, our first step to finding some of the guidelines uh, to making video that people actually choose to watch. Um, so to get us warmed up and start, uh, start us thinking critically about content, I'm going to show two videos, two pieces of content from the same brand. And to start off, I'm just going to show you fi the first five seconds of the video. And as you watch that, I want you to think about, like, would you really choose to watch the rest of the video just based on what you've seen um, if you're doing this you know, in, in your own life, just browsing content? Right? So watch the first five seconds uh, and be ready to let me know if you would actually watch the video. So here's the first clip. OK, lights up. Raise your hand if you would choose to watch this video. There are not a lot of hands out there. So raise your hand if you would skip this video or just move on and do something else. Almost everyone else, right? You're probably saying, oh, it's Kmart. It's a back to school ad. I either don't like Kmart or I don't care to watch an ad right now. And you'd probably just move on, which is too bad because now let me show you the rest of the video. You would have missed this. Show you how to ride to school. Yeah. You feel me? Uh, my school bus is my limo. My school bus is my limo. I roll back to school with my cap on and my limo. Show for you not for sure. And my school bus is my limo ride. Ride with me. Back to school in my limo. And fly is how you catch ya. Gear so fresh to have my own paparazzi. Make you look extra long because I'm a first race stunner. Shop your way this summer. Okay. That's how I roll, Jack. No need to roll. Put the smile up with me and my crew. And I'm back to school. Okay, we can, we can cut it there. <laughs> it keeps going, and it's all brilliant. Um, and I've had that song stuck in my head for the past week. Uh, all right, so that was the first piece of content. Um, let's look at the second. And again, we're just going to watch the first five seconds and then vote on whether we would, uh, whether we would watch it or not. you a question. What is it, Cup Padre? Did your mama get that hoodie at Kmart? <laughs> okay, show of hands. Who would watch this video? I mean, you got to see what happens next, right? And these kids are just amazing. Um, so let's watch the rest of this one. Yeah, dog. Well, your mama must have cow leaks because that hoodie is sweet. Oh, oh yeah? Well, your mama's like a tasty cheese plate. Cause she said I'll put your cheddar on them Kmart jeans. Oh! Well, your mama's got so much game that she couldn't even store it on that tablet. Oh! oh come on! Your mom's so fashion <laughs> forward, the future call, they want those high tops back. Oh! Well, your mama's so fiscally responsible, she got all that on free layaway. Oh! <laughs> Shop your way, members. Get free layaway at Kmart. New school year starts here. <laughs> Your mom's so fiscally responsible um, is a great line. Um, so just by watching these two videos, I think we've learned a couple of things. One is if you want to produce great video content, just hire these kids, and they should probably make you a video. Um, but second, the, the first few moments when you're encountering a piece of video content are really, really important. Like That's going to win or lose people um, just in a few moments. Um, so it's factors like that that I'm going to talk about today. Um, creative is really hard. It's really subjective. It's really contextual. So there hasn't been a lot of work done on like what are the, the best practices, the guidelines of what you need to be thinking about as a creator of, of marketing content, specifically videos. Um, but creative is one of the biggest uh, factors in campaign performance, if not the most important. Um, Dynamic Logics did a study where they took a whole aggregation of campaigns that they have exposure to, um, and they tried to isolate the various factors to see what caused the biggest swing in performance. And they found that the creative was usually 50 to 75 percent 
of the variability and effectiveness. So the most important factor, we actually did this internally um, at Google across all of our programmatic ad buys, and we found that about 70% of the variability was based on the quality of the creative. So creative, uh, as I think we all know, and why we're all here, uh, it makes or breaks campaigns, makes them successful or not. But again, it's really hard to study. So um, I think we have to have a few things in mind as we, as we go into this um, uh, mode of inquiry around what makes good video. Um, first is context matters a lot, right? Because people consume video differently on YouTube than they do TV. And for, the, for this purpose, I'm only gonna be talking about YouTube and the research we've done on our platform. But what we know is that TV tends to be more of a, uh, what you might call a, a lean back uh, medium. So people turn on what they want to watch, and then they, uh, you know, TV can take its time capturing our attention. Whereas with YouTube, people are looking for immediacy, and if they don't see what they think they want to watch in just a few seconds, a few moments, um, they'll quickly uh, move ahead to the next, the next uh, piece of content and consider that instead. And if you want to see evidence of uh, how this is affecting the way content is produced, all you need to do is look at movie trailers on YouTube and how different they are than conventional movie trailers. So typically, if you're doing a, a movie trailer, you follow um, really the classic storytelling arc. So you set it up, you introduce the characters, the location, start to give an idea of what the story is gonna be about. You build the tension, you have those dramatic lines of dialogue or, uh, or uh, climactic moments, and you build until the, the eventual climax. Um, and then it cuts off and you have to go see the movie uh, if you wanna see what happens next. So here's an example of a trailer that was uh, very much created for the YouTube audience mindset. I focus on being prepared. I saved your life by bringing you here. I knew this day would come. It's not safe out there. Something's coming. So that was intense. Um, but if you, if you saw at the bottom, we were kind of noting where the different points of the storytelling arc were being surfaced in the trailer, and it was a mix of everything. And that's really the type of content that people who watch a lot of video on YouTube are starting to expect to see. Um, it's really intense, the flow is really fast. Um, that's one example of content that was very effective on a platform like YouTube. So if you go ahead to the next slide, um, besides the platform itself, just the device on which video is viewed can, can have a huge difference in how people receive it and what they look at. Um, so this is an eye tracking study uh, where the eye is focused is the, uh, is the intensity of, of those blotches on it. You've probably seen this before. Um, but if you'll note, as we look at this Acura commercial, um, the, the, where the eye lands tends to be a lot more focused uh, on a larger screen, on a TV. Um, whereas it tends to be all over the place on mobile, just because your eyes can move so easily. Um, and what we find is that like, the wide sweeping cinematic shots that have a lot of impact uh, on a large screen don't really have as much impact and don't attract the eye as much on a smaller screen. But then you can also lose detail when you're on mobile, so that has some implications as well. So not just the platform that people are viewing video, but even the device on which they're viewing video can have uh, a significant impact on results. So that begs the question, are we doing this right now? Are we really creating content that's specific to the platform and specific to the device? And the answer is not really. Um, so when we looked at uh, campaigns across 2016, only about 38% had a coordinated creative strategy, which is to say that their creative across all of their channels had the same theme, the same topic, it was planned together. Um, as well as creative cust customized for the platform. So if they were doing YouTube, they cut the video differently, or they somehow uh, made it different so that it would work better, it'd be more effective on um, that particular platform. So I think there's still a lot of room to grow here, um, and that's good, because it means our, our campaigns can be more effective. So what I'm gonna talk about today is how to make your content shine by understanding the YouTube context, what's unique about YouTube and its viewers, um, and we're gonna unlock some data to really show what works. So to put this in a more grandiose way, content is king, context is God, data is its religion. We're gonna be looking at content in the context of YouTube, and we're gonna be looking at a whole lot of new data. Um, 
Jim Stengel, the, the past CMO of PNG, said, if you want to know how the lion hunts, don't go to the zoo, go to the jungle. And of course, what he's talking about is marketing here. He's saying that we have a tendency as marketers to try to kind of cage our content, feed it, grow it from, grow it in, in, the, in the zoo, uh, and then when the time is right, we release it. Instead, we should be putting things out in the wild and see how people react to it, which is exactly the approach that, that um, YouTube took when doing the research that I'm going to share. Um, our, our, um, our version of that, our jungle, was the TrueView ad. So who here knows what a TrueView ad is? Seems like most people do. Um, who here has been on YouTube and gotten the prompt to skip an ad if they want? OK, then you've seen a TrueView ad. And in fact, you are a part of this research because this is how we essentially tested whether people were likely to view a video. We, you know, we looked at all of the, the TrueView ads that have been run. And then we made some conclusions around what the factors were that caused people to choose to watch them. So this is, a, is quite a large data set. We looked at over 6,000 different creatives run on YouTube um, across 16 countries, 11 different industry verticals. And then we actually went and manually tagged 170 different uh, creative attributes so that we could start to um, identify what are the characteristics in common across all of this that makes people want to watch videos. Pretty cool, right? Um, so the, the kind of the methodology here is we were doing a lot of A/B tests, looking at videos side by side, seeing um, if we can isolate certain factors and improve performance in A/B tests. Um, we did something called Unskippable Labs with a lot of our um, uh, interesting customers and agencies who wanted to participate. So essentially, we made them create content to test and to um, take some of these hypotheses we're learning and um, do actual creative variations and see if they hold true um, uh, with a degree of accuracy. And finally, obviously, we're doing a lot of quant analysis here, trying to um, isolate the factors that uh, most drive view through on creative and get the most watch time. So these are guidelines that I'm going to share, not silver bullets. Um, creative is still incredibly contextual. Um, it matters what the business is. It matters what mindset your viewer is in. So I'm not going to say these things are going to work every time. But they're pretty good guidelines for uh, as you start to think about creative or content execution um, on YouTube. So what I'm going to share uh, is what I'm calling the ABCDs of YouTube. Um, and that's these things. First, uh, we'll talk about how to attract people to your video content. So what's going to capture enough attention that they'll consider to watch it. We'll talk about the role of branding in video and how much or how little you should use your brand. Um, we'll talk about establishing a connection during the video that um, causes people to keep watching and sustains that, that viewership, allows them to get your full story. Uh, and then we'll talk about directing uh, and the idea of like what do you want people to do after they see your video content. Uh, that'll be the next 30 minutes. If I have a little time afterwards, I'll talk about some of the initiatives that my team is working on to make it easier to create new videos uh, as marketers. So first, how do you get people to consider watching your video in the first place? So how do we attract the viewer? Um, if, you're, if you watched Jason Miller earlier on the stage today, uh, you saw him do a brilliant takedown of what I'm about to share with you, which is the idea that the attention span has shortened to less than that of a goldfish. And he made a very valid point. Um, scientists have done studies on the human brain, and they've come to the conclusion that our attention span, as we adapt to the modern world and all of its, you know, all of the behaviors we have, uh, smartphones included, but not limited to that, that the human attention span is actually getting shorter from 12 seconds in 2000 to 8 seconds in 2013. Um, and to be fun, we, compa we compare that to that of a goldfish, which is 9 seconds, and conclude that humans have a shorter attention span than a goldfish. Um, of course, scientifically, you can poke a lot of holes in this. Um, the, the way that we're studying humans is very different than we came to the conclusion on goldfish attention span. Um, but I think it is really important to note that humans on YouTube behave a lot like goldfish when they're looking for videos. Um, and, and actually, when we look at the, the time they're considering um, any online impression um, from a marketer, typically it's about three to five seconds that we have to hook our audience. So as we were seeing in the videos earlier, uh, the, those first three to five seconds are incredibly crucial. Um, and so at least in this aspect of your marketing, you should be thinking uh, of people a little bit like goldfish. Um, 
So what do we do with that? Um, how do we make those first few seconds really, really compelling so that we get people to um, actually watch? Um, the first tactic that um, has been shown to be very effective in our research is opening up with the unexpected. So something funny or surprising at the very moment that people are introduced to your video tends to have a real good amount of stickiness. So let's watch this, uh, this example of video. Fern, honey, use the Earth's energy to hit the pinata. Chili crisps! Feast, everyone, feast, enjoy. I don't like it here. Meet Nito, the smartest, most powerful robot vacuum. Now that, that opening had very little to do with robotic vacuums, but it was really unexpected and you wanted to see what happened next. Setting up situations like that can be really effective. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, celebrities and people are the best thing to put in your opening frames. Um, people love looking at other people. This is, this is well known. Um, but featuring a person at the beginning, specifically women, children, and celebrities tend to have the, the highest um, uh, view through rate. Um, uh, Oprah, probably your number one uh, celebrity you can do. That's actually not scientific, but I, I'm pretty sure she would be up there. Um, I won't show you this video, but uh, this got over a million views on, on YouTube. Um, it was uh, produced by Weight Watchers, and it's just Oprah talking about her favorite breakfast and how she makes it and how many Weight Watchers points she has. But if Oprah is in it, uh, people will watch it. Um, crop shots are interestingly um, much more um, effective than other types of uh, composing scenes when we, when we look at uh, video watch rates. So medium to close shots um, of people early on tends to play better on smaller mobile screens and attracts more attention. So we'll look at this video and see how they use that crop shot to introduce uh, the storyline. I have three kids and I work from home, so people always ask me how I stay so calm and organized. <laughs> I'm kidding. Do you think I have time for a bath? I'm fully clothed. I fell in the tub while I was timing my son holding his breath. <gasps> 26 seconds! Now go fetch mommy's hair dryer. Motherhood goes by too fast. I haven't slept more than four hours in 12 years. My diet consists of the protein bars and pita chips I inhale in the dark in my pantry. And my children are growing like weeds, but I barely have enough time to keep them alive, let alone print pictures of them. Because <laughs> here's the problem. What the fork? Making photo books sucks. It sucks. Don't say suck. They're designed for moms with lots of free time. Imaginary moms. What? A hedgehog. Really? Formatting them takes hours. It may push some buttons. In the end, they easily cost $50. So when Sarah does something adorable, I have to say, mm, that's cute, but not $50 cute. But at least scrapbooking's great if you have no job or no kids, so not great. Jeffrey, put down the crossbow. Okay, we can cut that off there. Uh, this so goes on tired. to. This video goes on to tell the story of uh, a service that actually prints out automatically scrapbooks and sends it to you. So a cool product, something that didn't exist before and they kind of have to explain to you what it is for you to understand it. Um, but rather than leading with that basic product description, they're weaving a story in here that starts with that, that compelling close shot and then unfolds with humor um, to keep you watching. So a really effective way of talking about the product but integrating it into a story that people have an emotional connection to. So all of the examples that I shared so far were in the context of you're showing an ad within a, a, an in-stream um, situation, so a TrueView ad. Um, but it's also important on YouTube to make sure that you're appearing in all the organic places uh, the videos can appear, and you're taking advantage of, of that as a distribution um, source. So three things that I would recommend when you're thinking about how to get more organic uh, exposure using YouTube. The thumbnails that you're using, there's specific things you can do with that. The metadata is, of course, important. And think about using playlists to, to boost uh, the number of times your video can be shown to users. So on thumbnails, um, let's do a quick exercise here. Um, so this is for a GE video. Um, which of these do you think would be the most effective thumbnail? So we actually tested all of these with GE, and, uh, and we saw in the real world what worked best. So, 
who here thinks number one would be the best video or the best thumbnail for the video? Any takers? No takers? Okay. What about number two with the potatoes and the light? Number two? Okay, pretty decent showing there. What about number three? Here we add in some text. Okay, I think this is the winner so far. And number four, which I think this is a cake. I'm not really sure what the frosting thing is. Anyone like number four? Okay, we've got someone who likes number four. Someone, someone likes cake and maybe wants to, thinks there's a recipe beyond that. Um, okay, so the winner here was actually number two, interestingly. Um, what we've learned about thumbnails, first, obviously, clear and in focus is important. Um, high resolution, um, something that's close up so you can see what's going on, and visually interesting. Um, putting text on thumbnails actually like, very significantly decreased um, the, the clicks on those videos. Um, I think it is probably because people um, have a connotation that, that implies marketing or advertising. I'm not really sure on the reason for that, but, but words on the video was definitely a negative. I think what's going on here is, the first one, I don't think we can even tell what that is. It's very unclear what, what, the, what the video might be about. Second, does a good job of, of setting up the story. Um, four is a brand, and we do see putting branding in the thumbnail tends to decrease um, the click-through rate on organic exposures on YouTube. So that's a, a quick primer on thumbnails. I think also worth, worth mentioning is um, these, the, the photo you're using in the thumbnail is going to appear differently or uh, appear in different contexts, such as search, suggested videos, and mobile. So you want to be thinking about like, the, the size of that mobile impression that's relatively small, and make sure that your story that you're trying to tell in that image is able to get out even in a, in a small mobile environment. So next up, metadata. I think this goes out without saying, but every single descriptive factor that you can put into your description or any of the tags related to your video are extremely important. This is way more important on video than any other type of content, because obviously it's harder for us uh, as a search engine to, um, to understand the, meta, the, the video content versus the metadata that you're provi providing. So metadata has a really huge impact in how your video is um, appearing in search results um, and organically on YouTube. Um, titles are probably the most important part within the, the text description that you can apply to your video. And really what we found um, is the common factor among good headlines is that it tells the story of what people are going to expect in your video. It may even introduce some tension or uh, like a question that's going to get resolved in the video, but you have to watch the video to find out. So as an example, let's look at, uh, um, at this image here and think about what the, the headline could be. So like, just think about like, you see this, how likely are you to watch the video? And then I'll tell you what the title is. So the title of this is How Much Do Shadows Weigh? And I, I kind of thought, oh, well, actually, I would watch that video. Just the image alone, I would never do that. But the image plus the, the story that's starting to be told in the headline can become really compelling. So think about, are you telling a story when you write headlines for, uh, for YouTube videos? Um, the, the final tip I'll share is um, playlists. So I think playlists are a really underutilized um, tool for making your content more discoverable. So if you have a number of videos on a similar topic, group them together on a playlist, and you're much more likely to get follow-on views of your content and show, show your, your users more than one video. So that's the most basic use. But um, very YouTube-savvy advertisers like Taco Bell um, they actually not only put their own brand's content, but also user-generated content from other people. Here's someone reviewing the Quesa Lupa uh, and, and so on. Um, so what this does is now when people watch those, those uh, third-party videos, they're most likely going to get served this, this playlist on the right, have it be a suggested video result. So it's more chances for your, your own content to get exposed by association with these videos. And having videos in playlists is a factor um, to the overall um, organic ranking of videos in YouTube search results. Okay, right. so one of the most common questions that we get asked, um, and in what our next section will be about, is how should I use my brand in video, right? So do uh, I want that brand recall, so should I feature it prominently, 
or is that going to turn people off who are, you know, would, would otherwise be interested in my content if they feel like it's, it's too produced, it feels too much like marketing? So the answer on that is really, it depends. Okay? I would think about what are your objectives in the video. If you are just really looking to drive awareness of your brand name or your product, there probably is a benefit of putting your, your brand earlier in the video so that you make sure that even people who skip halfway through still have the chance to uh, associate the content with your brand and to keep your brand top of mind. But if you're really trying to tell a whole story and maybe drive mid-funnel consideration, um, be a little more sparing in how you apply the branding to your video. Um, because what we find is that the full view through rate does decline pretty proportionately with the level of branded content that you find in the video. So there's also some things you can do um, when you are using branded content to make it a lot more palatable to viewers and effective. Um, integration and the thoughtfulness of integration is really important. Um, so you want your product to feel natural in the video, not that you know, someone who's watching YouTube, 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 all of a sudden ad, you know, looks like marketing content, um, but instead something that feels natural and interesting. So I think this, uh, this video, which is from Tic Tac, does a great job of leveraging kind of their iconic brand and packaging uh, in a way that's still fun and natural. Okay, so obviously that's, that's packaged as an ad, but it kind of has the feel of a YouTube video. It seems very contextually appropriate. Um, another thing that marketers can do um, is think about uh, branding not with a typical logo, but actually showing the product. Um, so just using a product rather than a logo can have the same benefit of increasing ad recall and uh, association with the brand, but it feels a little less salesy. It feels a little more appropriate for the YouTube context. So here's an example of a brand that did that well. Never again. Mom, where's the picture of my touchdown from last week? Oh, um, here you go, honey. Just scroll to the left. Why are your parents wrestling? Wrestling. And why is your dad handcuffed? He looks scared. To the right! Scroll to the right! So you saw, you saw the Canon product there, but it was very much a part of the story, which was a hilarious story. Um, and if you're thinking about really increasing the, the brand horsepower of your video, um, think about not just visuals that, that, tell, um, that, that showcase your brand or surface your brand, but also using audio and video together. And again, this is if you're really just trying to drive brand recall and awareness. Here's, a, here's an example of a video that does this very well. Use bounce dryer sheets for static clean? No. Billy! Quick ad, but uh, you, uh, you remember the brand. Okay, so the, the next section I'll talk about um, some of the things we learned from this research about what makes uh, viewership stay through the video. So what are the factors that lead to continued engagement with video? Um, the, the, my first tip here is every video is different, so why not learn about your own videos by using analytics? So you can, on YouTube analytics, look at exactly where in the video your view through rate is dropping, and then go and look at that, that piece of the video and think about, oh, is there a way I could edit this differently? Is there a way I could cut it differently? Is there a way I could tell the story differently that would kind of fix that place where you seem to be losing viewers? Um, so that's absolutely fundamental. Should be doing this with all of your content. Um, I think the pro tip is, from the beginning, shoot multiple pieces of content um, and look, do this for each and then think about your editing strategy to combine all those different cuts, and you'll learn a lot really, really fast. So the, uh, among the factors that we um, were able to parse out and see what works best as far as what causes continued viewership, what makes people continue to watch videos, 
The number one, not surprisingly, in the YouTube context is humor. People love videos that make them laugh, and if you can get someone to, to laugh, there's a good likelihood that they'll continue to watch your video. So um, I want to show a B2B example, just because that's not what you typically associate with humor, but there's actually great ways to tell stories involving B2B brands that still do involve humor and have a more human, personal element. So here's one that I like. <laughs> That's why video conferencing is important. Uh, nice, nice ad. Um, close second to humor is emotion. So uh, empathetic sympathy in the video. Um, it's one of the most easiest ways to make an emotional connection to the viewer. You have to be careful when you're using emotion because you don't want it to seem contrived um, or um, not authentic about your brand. Um, but when it's well done, uh, it's usually extremely effective. So we can look at this video as an example of a video that really plays to emotion effectively and authentically. So like when you're, when you're doing something like this, um, this is for the ad council, but my advice to a brand is typically you're not talking about your brand when you're bringing in emotional factors. You're kind of saying what the values of your brand are. In this case, it's promoting um, diversity and inclusion in an unexpected place in, this, in the football kiss cam. Um, but usually you need to create a story, create something above and beyond your brand, but use it to tell values that are um, authentic and believable for your brand. So we go to the next slide. Um, pacing is super important, obviously, um, when, it, uh, when it comes to connecting with users and having them continue to watch your video. Um, the master of this, I think, is Nike. If you've ever watched any of Nike's YouTube content, they do such a superb job of editing, and I'm sure that they are definitely in analytics, looking at every single moment and how do they maximize the stickiness and the watch time. Um, but it's really just brilliant work. So let me show this example from Nike that I think illustrates this really well. Move 
on, but uh, I think you can see like brilliant editing there. Um, it, the music is driving a lot of the, you know, the drum beat is moving the, the content along, but I think it's also great editing, great cinematography. The fluidity of all the shots and how they work together is part of what's sustaining the viewer's interest. So finally, uh, I'm gonna talk about directing um, attention once the video is over, which is really important. Like we shouldn't, the, the goal isn't just to get someone to view your video, but actually to, to take action, to do something about it is, is really as marketers what's important to us. Um, so this is something you, you're probably already familiar with, but putting a call to engage in the video, um, especially if your objective is to, to drive sales or some action, um, make sure that's embedded in the video itself. I'll show a really quick example of, from Old Spice of how this is done well. Destroy Dirt's confidence with deep cleaning Old Spice Dirt Destroyer. Okay, that's the product, that's where you buy it, and you get this promotion too. So that was in only five seconds. So this can be done quite quickly with video. There are many tools at your disposal within YouTube, such as overlays and in screens, that can drive interactivity and actually have a two-way-ish conversation with the, with the viewer. Um, but it can be used to drive actions like click, download, learn more. Here's an example of, a very sophisticated example of using these to actually drive the storyline of a video. Left Twix, delicious cookie, flowed with caramel and cascaded in chocolate. It's come to my attention that Right Twix is attempting to lead you away from this important Left Twix message. We at Left Twix appreciate your staying with us. After all, we have nothing against puppies. We just don't believe in pandering to our customers with cheap attempts at winning their affection. Okay, here's what I'll promise. If you agree not to go watch Right Twix's puppy, we at Left Twix will deliver you a vastly superior puppy viewing experience. <laughs> okay, you can stop that there. Um, so, if you, if you fall victim to this ad, you're going to be in a... Uh, roundabout clicking back and forth between right, right Twix and left Twix. But it's a good example of playing with that, um, those features that are available to marketers. Um, so finally in direction, think about remarketing. Like most of the time, people on YouTube are not going to click on an ad. It's just not typical be behavior. People are there to watch videos. Um, usually not do what, as marketers, we would want for them to do next, but you can still um, take advantage of the fact that they watched a full video or have done other things such as visit your website and be extremely intentional about what videos you're showing which users and when. Um, I'll skip this example, but uh, this, uh, to, to tell you the story of what Canon is doing here, um, they have uh, examples of what happens when you bring your camera and when you don't bring your camera and they only show the, the second video to people who actually watched on TrueView uh, the first ad. So it starts to tell a story, and that sequential storytelling we found really, really drives brand lift and important metrics for advertisers. So definitely following up, not just with a second impression of the same ad, but something that continues the story can be a really effective way of uh, sustaining the customer's attention, um, but also driving ad recall and brand lift. So these were the ABCDs, uh, attract, uh, brand, connect, and direct. Um, again, these came from research that we've done. They're only guidelines, but these are the most common um, factors that stood out across all of the videos that we looked at in this set. Hope this was useful for you. Um, would love to uh, answer any questions or tell you more about these examples. We won't have time to do questions now, but uh, I'll be around later. Thank you so much for coming.